So, kind of like the informal, like who I am kind of thing. And I've been up here, so I kind of feel like I have uh, commonality with you uh, folks here because I've been up um, several times. I enjoy giving talks just like this because a big part of my job as a financial planner is just educating people. And I love to help uh, families plan. Uh, and, and that's really all kinds of families. I really believe in financial planning and that if you have a plan, it's just going to help your uh, life go better. So, <laughs> uh, but I, I have a particular emphasis or focus on special needs families because that plan involves a whole other layer of complexity. And so that's, uh, and a lot of my prior background was in healthcare policy, like Medicaid, long-term care, so it really fit well. There's not a lot of financial planners who do planning for special needs families. It's just not really that heard of. Um, now, there's a lot of estate planning attorneys that kind of help um, families set up a trust, and I'll be talking about that, but that's, there's a lot more to planning, probably as you know, is everyone here providers or some of your family members or both? I think we have a little mix. A little mix, okay. That's what I thought. So, you know, just from your own experience, you realize there's, there's more to planning than just, you know, setting up the paperwork, you know. And, and that's where I uh, feel like I come in as a planner, because I'm gonna help uh, help you determine not just you know whether to set up a trust or set up an able account but also like how much money you need to be setting those things up uh, and uh, how much um, you know kind of just try to match your goals not just for your loved one but for yourself and uh, how much money it takes to do all that so I our firm, we don't, we don't try to sell products, and this is a little bit about who I am as, as a person. We don't we consider ourselves fee-only financial planners. So a lot of times when people think about financial planning, they think about managing investments, and that's a part of it, but uh, it's only a part of it. So especially when you talk about special needs planning, you're talking about uh, estate planning, okay, you're talking about minimizing taxes, you're talking about retirement planning, and it's how all those things work together. But yeah, we're not trying to sell insurance or sell stock. That's not how our uh, business model works. Really want to do what's best for the family and the individual. So that's kind of a, a longer uh, intro of who I am and what I do. Okay. okay, so what we're going to cover today is what is a special needs trust, uh, some things you need to consider uh, in opening up a trust, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit, in fact I'm going to sprinkle throughout the presentation uh, talking about stable accounts versus special needs trust, and then I'll touch upon uh, pool trust, okay? Uh, one thing, when I first came up here, it's been about a year and a half ago, uh, I did a presentation on ABLE accounts. So either yourselves or working with your clients, uh, ha have you set up or helped your clients with uh, ABLE accounts? Any of you? So, do you think it's stable? Mm -hmm. Stable. And I'll use, I do okay. interuse it. Yeah, I always use them interchangeably. Uh, and I'll do that during the presentation. The, the difference, there's really no difference. This ABLE account is a federal legislation that enabled the states uh, to set up these programs. So stable is kind of like the Ohio brand of, of, of these accounts. And so, yeah, if you, you use term stable, that's fine. I'd like to say able just because occasionally I, um, I'm talking to families that are outside of Ohio. Now so. I understand that um, those who act as representative payees are unable to manage stable accounts for these same individuals. Is that true or? 
Now, I really haven't looked too much into it, I have to admit. But now, now that's fine. And and I haven't recently studied this issue. When I, when I spoke on this a year and a half ago, that was a real hot topic because I had a lot of folks like yourself who are rep payees, and it's like, wow, we can't do anything uh, for the individual. And it's like, no, you really couldn't. Uh, you had to be a family member uh, or a guardian. Um, but I think there is a workaround where you can get a power of attorney, uh, is what I heard. Okay, so I'm seeing some people nod their head. So if you can get a power of attorney set up to do that, uh, then, you, then you can as a rep payee. I haven't, I haven't vouched for that, but you and, have the answer? Well, I don't know that I have an answer, but I have a potential workaround that we've been told, Ann, is if you are the rep payee for an individual and the individual comes in and meets with you on a regular basis okay. to do their financial planning, if you sure. will, or their monthly bill payment, if the person is there, you are allowed to assist them with opening oh, right, their account. Sure. Oh, sure. And then your management of that account, you're not managing it, they're managing it, but as their rep payee, you're assisting them with that management, just like you are with their checkbook. You yeah. don't take their checkbook and go out and write and you know do their shopping for them necessarily. You assist them with writing their checks to get what they need. And, and that's... Right. Not normally, well, actually, as a payee, normally I do write the checks. With okay. with them there sometimes not okay. usually <laughs> and that's that's some that's, yeah. that, well that's the uh, that's a crossing line in a way you know so if if you're kind of doing all the stuff mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> they're not really managing it so so it kind of is this gray area right where yeah. you could say hey it's the individual controlling and I'm assisting yeah. you know then right. then you because the individual can set up a stable account sure. yeah. right. Right. So that That's would be my recommendation, okay. and then as long as the individual's entire team knows yes. the account information and that's listed out in their ISP, not necessarily their passwords and things, but that sure, they have sure. this account and that they're in control of it with your assistance, gotcha. then it's, it's good perfectly good. I would not be comfortable with you going in and doing things with the account without the individual sure, sure. there. Sure, no, I, and that's but, what we're trying to steer away from as yep. well because we, were, we weren't really sure. And, yeah, but I think doing it with them, everything sure. I've ever heard is okay. perfectly I mean, and okay. And that's fine. I mean, it gets, okay. um, that, that's, uh, I think, a good workaround. So, yeah. okay. Right. So anyways, that's a good question. And like I said, throughout the presentation, we'll kind of uh, talk about how stable accounts and special needs trusts, their similarities, where they're different. And, and really, what I would love for you to get out of this presentation uh, should I spe set up a special needs trust? Is those two uh, vehicles are complementary? They're not uh, adversarial. You know, it's not an either or. It's a both and. Okay. So, uh, so you know, that's the one thing I'd love for you to get out of the presentation. The other thing is, you know, when people think about special needs trusts, they think about uh, you know something that is really for people with lots of assets, wealthier people, and, and something that's just kind of like out of touch for the ordinary person. And I would say that's largely an incorrect notion that um, special needs trust is something that most families need to consider. If you have uh, assets just from your house that you're going to have to pass over to someone upon your death, then then you need to consider a special needs trust. It's, that's not the only uh, reason you want to do it, but I guess I just mentioned that as an example because most people own their home or will you know, own their home upon their death, and how are they going to dispose of that asset? What are they going to do with that? Okay. Um, so, so I would say you know, that's another goal of the presentation is that you know special needs trust is something that most people need to consider. So all right. Let's move on here. Okay, so in talking about special needs trust, let's just take a step back and talk about trust in general. Why people use trust uh, and what are they? So a trust is really just a legal agreement that uh, is used in estate planning that helps determine how uh, the assets of an individual are distributed upon death. Okay, And so 
a lot of um, advantage to, to that. Uh, it, you know, the assets of an individual, uh, when they die, they have to be um, given away somehow. And so usually, how would you think of that as uh, being determined? Through a, can anybody just throw that out there? Will. Will, right, it's through a will, right? But a lot of times, um, with that, that uh, there, it has to go through a probate court, okay, to determine, um, you know, there could be a challenge to that will, uh, uh, and, and things can get uh, messy in terms of how assets are distributed if you go through the probate court. Uh, if uh, you're just talking about a trust, though, there's no real reason um, to go, um, you know, have, that's not reviewed by a probate court. This stands alone uh, in terms of how it's directed. The trustee, uh, you know, directs how uh, assets are, are distributed according to the terms of the trust. Okay, so that's like a key advantage for a lot of families, whether it's typical families or special needs families. It's like, let's not, you know, go through the probing process because that can be costly and time consuming. So, uh, when we talk about trust, uh, let's just talk about a couple terms here. One is the grantor, who is the person who creates a trust. So, in the examples I'll use, I talk about the parents, okay, of the individual with special needs. There's a trustee who is the uh, person who uh, is designated in the trust to help manage the trust uh, upon, um, well, it's the person who manages the trust. It can be the grantor uh, while they're living, but you know, when the grantor dies, then there's another uh, person that's designated who's a, um, the trustee who operates the trust. And then, this is something we'll talk about a little bit uh, in the presentation. I mean, because that person is legally obligated. He, has a, he or she has a fiduciary responsibility to represent the best interest of the beneficiary of the trust. And that's the other term I'll mention is the beneficiary, and that is the person who receives uh, the benefit of, of the trust. So I'll kind of like start using those terms. I'm not a lawyer, but it's just easier to talk about things uh, with those terms. Are, is there any questions about what each of those things are? Okay. Um, there's a common misconception when you think about trusts that uh, when they're set up, they have to be funded. And most of the time, uh, that's just not the case. It's maybe uh, the family uh, sets that up uh, with, with a lawyer and, uh, you know, when they die, the will directs assets to the trust. And so, uh, so you don't necessarily have to think about the trust being, it can be funded while you're alive, but most of the time, I guess, uh, it's probably advantageous not to do it that way. And, and, you know, there's a couple reasons for that, and that is there's a cost uh, of managing the trust on an ongoing basis when there's funds in there. And it just adds a layer of complexity. If the family member or the grantor is alive, he could be directing income or assets to the individual on their, or beneficiary on their own. They don't need to be um, tied down by a trust document necessarily. So, okay. Any any questions on those terms or just what a trust is in general? Okay. If I'm going too slow, I could pick up the pace, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay. So a special needs trust is just has has same kind of characteristics as a or a lot of the same characteristics as a regular trust, except it's it's set up for individuals with special needs. So we're talking about um, beneficiaries uh, who lack the mental capacity to manage their own financial affairs. Um, 
the key, key benefit of a special needs trust, and this is where it's similar to a stable account, is that assets in that trust don't count as a resource when you're uh, talking about Social Security or Medicaid eligibility. So that's, um, you know, that's a key advantage that, and that's, that's why a lot of uh, people set them up. Okay. So when we talk about special needs trust, there's really two types. One is uh, the special needs trust, first party trust. Those are funds coming from the individual. Okay. So when would that happen? Okay. There, there's kind of like two main reasons that the individuals would have significant uh, assets. One is through some kind of uh, settlement from a lawsuit, and the other is um, that there's some kind of uh, Social Security back payment they were due. Okay, so I see some nod heads. You're familiar with that. And if you don't have a special needs trust set up, as providers, it's like that's a bummer, right? Because all of a sudden you're. So you have to set it up on the fly. Yeah, and, and you can't do that. But in that interim, it's a hassle, yes. right? So time was of the essence. You had about two months. Okay. Medi Medicaid um, dictates that you have only two months to do a spend down. Um, there's only a certain amount of money an individual is allowed to carry okay. per month. Right. So you have right. two months to spend it down. So we, time was of the essence to set up a trust for that Social Security back pay. So Medicaid was going to punish us for Social Security's error. So <laughs> it's just kind of one of those. Right. right. So it's a large one. And so, and so you found, a, I, do you guys work with a state planning attorney? Um, well, my boss goes through a company, gosh, I cannot even think of what it is now. Okay, now that's fine. And they have trust set up for that individual and, and then... So you guys were able yes, to do another fly. Yes, and for request the money strong or what have you, but... Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I would say, I guess from a family perspective, I mean, you're not going to necessarily just set these up just in case. But if you have a good inclination that the individual is going to be receiving uh, significant um, money, then you, you're going to want to have it set up, okay? Um, so the other uh, type of trust is a third party, or it's also referred to as a third, uh, wholly discretionary uh, family trust. And so uh, how, you know, how that, how they, how those uh, trusts get funded is through the family or the grantor. It's not from the individual. So, two different types of trusts, and they're, and they're, I mean, two different types of special needs trusts. And they, they have slightly uh, uh, different characteristics that I'll mention. Okay. So the first party trust we already talked about is funds from the individual. Uh, the uh, disabled beneficiary must be 65 or younger when the trust is, is created. Uh, we already talked about special needs trust not impacting Social Security or elig uh, Medicaid eligibility. I mean, they don't count as resources. Uh, we will talk about later you have, to, you have to think about how uh, distributions are made from the trust. Um, so that's, that's we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, with a first party trust, it, it, and this is where it's similar to a stable account, um, at the end of the individual or the beneficiary's life, those assets remaining in the first party trust will go back to, to pay the Medicaid program to the extent that they receive Medicaid services. So let's say there's $100,000 in that uh, first party trust and the individual received $300,000 of you know, Medicaid or waiver benefits over the course, from the time the trust is set up to when the individual dies, then you know, that would exceed the amount you know, in, in the trust, and so all that money would go back 
how far it would, would go to pay Medicaid program. Now, there's things that you could do to kind of, you know, you could buy uh, a Medicaid, bar you know, a, a burial plot for the individual, to make sure the funeral services are taken care of, you know, take care of all the necessary uh, uh, expenses of the individual upon death. But at the end of the day, there, there's not going to be assets there more than likely to pass on. Um, and, and that's just a part of, you know, kind of like the rules governing uh, first party trusts. So any, any questions about that? Okay. I do have a question. Yes. It says on there that the beneficiary must be under the age of 65 yes. in order to do it. Yes. That's the same for special needs trusts? Um, for first party special needs trusts, right. So if they were in an accident and they were 66 years old and got a settlement from an accident. Right, it wouldn't be a special, yeah, it wouldn't be a special needs trust situation. So it wouldn't be a stable? Uh, like if you have, I have someone who's 66. And I see. Continually over resources. I see, so what do you do with that in that yeah. case? Um, there's other like, and I forget the vehicle on the long-term care side, like um, what kind of um, trust you would set up. I think it's um, a Miller trust, but I don't know a ton about those. Well, if it's just that they're over resources, not that they're not they're not getting a big lump sum. It's just that they have an extra thousand dollars every month. That's a Miller month. trust issue. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that take care. Of, yes. But couldn't they do a stable account for that? Uh, okay. Because it's not a lump sum. It's just they have $500 well, every month. To okay, right. Away. But remember with stable accounts, uh, and this is a, a difference between the special needs trust and stable, is that that condition needed to be uh, before they were age 26. So if they and were... they are. They oh, are. Yeah. Okay. They're yeah, eligible for a, services now. Yeah, they're just at a point in their life where they don't need any more couches and they don't want to go on vacation. Right, but they right. can't afford to lose their Medicaid. Right, yeah. So I mean, and and you'll have to kind of figure out when it'd be advantageous to to go through a special needs trust first party versus the able account or stable account. Remember, or or I'm telling you, with the stable account, the the key limitation is let's say you had a settlement for a hundred thousand dollars or a back payment, um, you can only uh, the beneficiary or that that able account can only receive fifteen thousand right um, this per year, year right? per year. Uh, if they have work earnings, it's more than that. But you know that's a key reason why you want to think about special needs trusts is because of this limitation on the able account side of how much money can be received in, per year. Okay. You said. If it wasn't their work earnings, then I thought it was still entitled to only the fifteen thousand, regardless of where it, it's. Yeah, it's fifteen thousand uh, per year. But if they have work earnings, it can go all the way up to, I think it's like twenty nine thousand and some change. I don't have the exact number. I mean, if they earn like up, to, you know, if they earn fourteen thousand, you need to add that on to the fifteen thousand. Okay. And that's its limit, its new limit, upper limit. So the 15000 is unearned income, whether that be by right. donation, so by you, or their Social Security is unearned income. And then they have an additional amount, I don't know what that amount is either, for their earned income. Right. And that will continually increase by inflation or whatever. Okay, some good questions. Any other thoughts or questions on the first party trust? Are there normally stipulations on besides that? Like, does an individual set it up? Then they would add their own stipulations on what it could be used on. Is Very that very good? That yes, trust? absolutely. Yes. So these are just kind of like general um, rules uh, federal government imposes or the state. Uh, but uh, yes, a family member or uh, the person who sets up the trust, the grantor, is going to stipulate how they want to um, see those assets uh, governed. And, and sometimes, well, it, you know, it really depends on that grantor. 
But I think what's key, and this gets into the trustee business, is uh, if you, you know, you gotta be careful on how you select a trustee. It, but if you have implicit uh, confidence and trust in that trustee, you're just gonna give him a lot of discretion. Mm -hmm. And so, in the trust uh, uh, documents I've seen, it doesn't sit there and say, you should limit the distributions to this amount in 2050, or, you know, it doesn't get real explicit. Um, and, and I think that's intentional because, you know, you don't want to tie down the trustee unnecessarily. And if, if you are worried, like, a lot about the trustee and how they're doing things, it's like, wow, maybe you shouldn't pick the trustee then. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and, and that's like a big, that's a big part of estate planning in terms of um, setting up a trust. That's also a very, a very much an impediment for families, as you, as you know. I mean, it's just like they, they just don't want uh, to be put that on a sibling. They don't feel like the sibling or a family member can handle it, and um, a lot of times that's probably true. So, um, so yeah, you can you can make stipulations in. I, I think a common stipulation in a trust document is, and, and this is getting more into a uh, third party um, trust, is you know how much of the trust is for each of the beneficiaries. So you, you know, we just talked about a single beneficiary, but you can have multiple beneficiaries. And so let's say you have three children, a third of it goes to, you know, this, this beneficiary, third to third, you know, so, so you can parse things out. Uh, you can name a successor trustee, which is important, or you can give the power of doing that to the trustee, okay, because a trustee might um, die, so, so he, he needs to uh, choose a successor trustee. So, okay, that is, that's a great question. Okay, so I started talking about a third party wholly discretionary trust, and that's not wholly as H O L Y. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's um, wholly discretionary in terms of that trustee has a lot of power uh, to do uh, to represent that best interest of the individual. You can make stipulations in, in the trust that the trustee has to follow. But he has a lot of discretion there. So that's why it's referred to as a wholly discretionary uh, trust. Um, you know, whether it's a first party or a third party trust, you really, uh, there has to be specific language in that trust, uh, one of which is um, there, there has to be some kind of provision that gives this trustee uh, this power uh, because. What Medicaid or Social Security is looking for is if there's language in there that, uh, if, if the right language is not in there, um, they're going to they're gonna wonder if the individual has access to those funds. Okay, if, if, uh, if the trust is set up right, it's like only the trustee, for the benefit of the individual, can, can really decide how funds are distributed. But if it's unclear, and the, and the individual really can access funds on their own, okay, then Medicaid or Social Security is gonna say, hey, that should be counted as a resource. They have control over that asset. So that's a little background about why there's just like, you have to have, it. and it's almost like template language, but you have to have the right language in there Otherwise, the, the, it's going to be invalidated as a special needs trust. And that kind of jumps to another slide I have about make sure you have the right uh, lawyer, you know, establishing or drafting uh, the special needs trust document. This is not your brother-in-law who's a lawyer who, you know, he wants to do this uh, for the benefit of the family member. And that's all cool, but you know, this is a, like a specific expertise. You know, so you're looking for an estate planning attorney who has familiarity with Medicaid, who has who has drafted special needs trusts before, who uh, 
has probably worked with the County Job and Family Services here in Sandusky uh, to that level, because like at the county level, that they have the right to review the trust document and uh, potentially invalidate. Okay, so if in talking to the lawyer who's drafting those things up and you're asking questions about, have you done this before, have you interacted with the county GFS and you're getting blank stares, that's a bad sign, okay? <laughs> But it's harder, kind of like in a non-urban area, to find people who do this. Okay, um, I mean, I often get you know asked, you know, who would you recommend? And I don't have anybody up in this area, so I'm not sure. I, um, do you guys re have a referrals for state planning attorney? I mean, we don't have a referral list, but we have several individuals that have them, and so we might give the names of the attorneys that are associated with those current trusts. Okay. Um, usually Toledo area. Toledo area, right, and yeah, there's probably folks up there, so, okay. The key difference, okay, the key difference between the third party and first party trust is that assets can remain um, with the trust upon the death of the individual, okay? So, um, you know, this is like a key concern for a lot of people, and this is a difference uh, when you're talking about the ABLE accounts or first party trusts, is that those funds largely are gonna go back to pay back Medicaid.